My name is Michael Geiger-Bronski and I am the founder and the president of the Door County Scotty Rally. And on behalf of our board, I want to welcome you to the first of what is going to be many DCSR Zoomies. We're very, very excited to uh, launch this program today. And I want to take um, a couple of moments to take care of a couple of housekeeping details. Um, first of all, thank you for all for um, tuning in this morning. And I apologize if you've gotten numerous um, messages regarding links, but hopefully this is all going to work for all of us. I want to encourage all of you to um, mute your, your um, uh, phones or laptops or whatever, whatever you're using this morning so that it does not disrupt our presentation. Secondly, um, continuing in this presentation, um, by you staying on board with us gives implicit consent for you to be um, recorded should there be any interaction between you and our speaker in terms of Q&A later on at the end of the program. We are going to ask that you hold all of your questions um, or you can go ahead at the very bottom of your screen. There's a, an icon down there that says chat. You can actually go ahead and type in um, your questions, please make them concise. Um, don't go on and on. And um, because we have a limited amount of time today. Um, so we're going to take questions and answers at the very end of our presentation today, just so you know. And Matt Lubeck, who is one of our, our uh, Door County Scotty Rally board members, who is um, just a gem, um, because he's been our, our main consult for for helping us launch this successfully today is going to serve as the moderator of those questions. Um, the other thing is going forward, we, are, we have enough topics to probably fill up the next 12 to 15 months. Um, and I'm, we're working really hard to find um, speakers for these topics and speakers with a lot of expertise, not just our local vets. So that being said, I wanna encourage you all to kind of think about um, saving probably, we're gonna try to shoot for the same Saturday every, every month, but that may not always be consistent with what our speaker schedule is. Just so you know, um, we will get schedules posted and make announcements um, in, a, in a timely manner going forward. Um, the topics that we're going to be looking at in the next few months will be one of the last slides that Jody shows you today. So you'll get a gestalt of what's coming up. Um, I'm trying to think. I think I've covered all the housekeeping details that I need to do. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, ask you to all mute yourself. And uh, Jody is going to be starting her presentation. Again, on behalf of our board, thank you very much for joining us for DCSR Zoomies. My kids were Zooming around the house this morning and I, it just made me laugh and feel so good about what we're doing today. So I'm gonna let Jody introduce herself and tell you a little bit about herself, but I do wanna tell you that I have been working with Jody for you know, probably close to 10 years now, it seems like. And um, I credit Jody with saving the life of our most challenging rescue dog that we've ever had. And I, I just cannot recommend her enough. So Jody, thank you for agreeing to join us this morning and it's all yours. Okay. So thanks, Michelle. So I'm like crying a little bit right at the beginning. <laughs> so good morning, everybody, and thanks for being here. I just want to mention a couple of things before we start. First, um, in this presentation, I'm going to give you material, general material. We're not going to be able to discuss specific solutions for your individual dog, but I do have some resources at the end for you. Um, on this page, I have my contact information at the bottom. The IAABC, this is, that's the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, and the Association of Professional Dog Trainers also have consultant locators. So if you're not in this area and you'd like to find someone who's qualified, who's gonna use positive methods to work with you, their websites um, allow you to find someone in your area. And I also have, um, in information about them listed at the end on the resources section. So um, just a very little bit about me. Um, my degree by education is in psychology. I've been in business for about 2000, for, uh, 
well, I started my business in 2000, so 21 years now. This is what I do full time for a living. Um, I do some classes. Um, I do a lot of behavior consults and well over half my caseload is dogs with aggression issues, either to people, to dogs or both. So it's an area that I'm real comfortable working with and have been working with for a long time. Um, I'm certified through a couple of organizations. I do some competition with my own dogs in um, rally, obedience, agility, canine nose work, fast cat. I've had therapy dogs. My dogs have all been um, canine good citizens. Uh, my husband, Dave and I, just a little bit about us. We have three dogs, Maya's 12. She's a rescued German Shepherd. She has quite a few titles um, and I'm really proud of her, um, especially as a rescue dog uh, to have done so much. Winston is our youngest. He's 20 months old. Um, he has a trick dog title and a fast cat title. He's a German Shepherd mix, also a rescue. We got a cat in November. This is Indigo, he's three and a half. He has no titles, but he's very handsome. And I'm actually starting to train him and doing some agility things and he does tricks too. So he's been a lot of fun. Okay, um, a just a little bit about the topic of aggression. This is a huge topic. And today we're only gonna cover a fraction of the, of the work that can be done to work with reactive dogs. Um, you know, in this field, you can go to a seminar that's two days on nothing but aggression. So it's a really broad topic. Um, if there's an interest, we may, you know, at some point in the future, do a more uh, targeted topic just on one issue. But I just want you to know that I'm going to give you some general things that work for many dogs, but it's certainly, this, there's certainly not, this is certainly not all that can be done. Okay. So what do we mean when we say reactive? So there are um, some behavioral or some behaviors that we tend to see when we think of dogs as being reactive. So aroused, barking, lunging, um, either moving towards people or retreating back behind people, acting in a threatening way, um, biting and nipping and redirecting onto the owner or another animal. This is sometimes you, you will see this when dogs become in a heightened state of arousal. You'll see it at doors where they all rush to the door and they redirect onto each other. You'll see it on walks where there are two dogs out and one turns on the other. You'll see it um, if the owners sometimes try to restrain their dogs. So maybe the dog's barking at the window and the owner tries to pull them away and the dog turns and bite, bites them too. So that can be under the umbrella of reactivity. Um, reactivity can be offensive or defensive and we don't have time to get into the nuances of this and what it is. That's another topic body language and how do you discern if something is offensive or defensive. In general, offensive is more about power and control. The body language, the vocalizations say, just so you know, I'm in charge here. Defensive behavior is more about fear. So again, and those are real general descriptions, but with an offensive dog, they're kind of trying to take charge, moving into, moving into the space of people. Defensive dogs are backing off and hoping that people will stay away from them. And you can also have dogs who are conflicted. So you can have dogs with elements of both offensive and defensive. For me, it's important to determine whether a dog's behavior is offensive or defensive because that um, sort of guides the treatment program that we're gonna give the dog. Okay, things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, how to manage your environment for your dog, how to manage the dog, uh, different tools and equipment that I really like, kind of my go-to pieces of equipment, and then training and strategies for working with dogs both on and off territory. Okay, so one important thing to know about reactivity and working with dogs with any kind of aggression issues is that all behaviors can be improved, but not all behaviors can be extinguished. So um, and that can be difficult for people to wrap their minds around sometimes. You know, when they call me, they're hoping that we can maybe take a dog who has pretty serious issues and completely eliminate the behavior. And often that's not the case. So I frequently tell people, I know we can improve your dog's behavior. We may or may not extinguish it um, completely. So, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. There's a lot of different influences on behavior. So, you know, we look at the dog's outward behavior but the dynamics, genetics, diet, all of these things on this diagram can um, influence a dog's behavior. And um, 
Yeah, and honestly, you know, each one of these things can be a separate topic in and of itself. Um, some people feel that behavior is just genetic. Some people feel that it is all socialization and training. Most people, myself included, feel that it's a combination of both. So sometimes I see puppies that are eight or 10 weeks old who have really serious behavior issues, you know, that really speaks to genetics. Um, other times we have dogs that um, the socialization or lack thereof is a big contributing factor. So um, aggression can be complicated. There are a lot of things that will influence it and medical can influence it too. There are a lot of different medical issues that will masquerade as a behavior issue or will exacerbate an existing behavior issue. So when I work with dogs, that's one piece that I'm always considering what's their medical history. Uh, sometimes even things like seizures will cause neurological changes and we start seeing an aggr aggression in a dog that previously, previously had no issues. So it's complicated. Okay, let's talk about managing the environment first. So a big piece of working with dogs um, with aggression issues is thinking, how can we set them up for success? How can we set them up to not practice behavior that you're trying to improve? So there are a lot of different things that you can do with the environment. So um, we want to eliminate sentry posts, or I call the tower of power. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a place that a dog may sit and like look out the window and bark at people, or they may stand at the top of their deck and bark at people and react. So we wanna eliminate those posts that, that have them feeling like they're on duty. Um, I talk with a lot of clients about fencing in their yard, especially if they're having uh, bites to people coming onto the property. We talk about blocking the dog's view or access to the front of the house. So some people will put up um, like a fence that blocks the dog's view to the front of the house, or they'll put up bushes blocking the view to the front of the house because that's where the action is and that's where people enter the property. Um, in the house, we talk about having gates near frequently used doors to prevent unplanned exits. That's especially if you, important if you have kids in the house. So we may put up a gate near an entrance or in front of the entrance so you have basically an airlock. So the dog isn't going to accidentally slip out if you open the door to get the paper or open the door to grab a package. Um, I see some dogs where, you know, people are doing everything right, but then, you know, one day they open the door to grab a package and at that moment someone walks by the house and the dog pushes back or pushes through and goes after the person or the dog. So gating gates can be very helpful. I have a lot of clients too. We talk about don't walk on busy streets or busy locations or busier times of the day until you've seen really noticeable improvement because that can just set the dog up to fail. You know, <clears throat> if we're having a dog with reactivity issues, we're gonna try not to take them say to the farmer's market or to you know a busy event. We may change the location of crates or enclosures. Again, away from a window, away from a doorway, places where the dog's just practicing behavior that you don't want. Um, I'll encourage people to post a sign if they have people coming and I have a couple examples of that. Uh, in general with dogs with reactivity, I don't recommend electric fences. Um, they're not, a fail safe. I like physical fences where nothing gets out and nothing gets in that you don't plan on. Um, if electric fence is used, um, I encourage people to keep it in the backyard only and the dogs are only outside and off leash supervised. In general, I'm not a fan of what's called a full perimeter installation of electric fences. There's a lot of um, behaviors that you see that come with that and I guess that's another topic. So here's a couple of examples of clients that clients of mine have done. So on the left, um, they put a sign up, you know, they want people just to not open the door. Let us get control of our dog and we'll open the door. And that sign is super helpful. These are clients who have a lot of friends who just kind of drop by and walk in. And so part of the work with their dog, who you see pictured there, super cute little dog, part of their work is training their visitors. Um, to knock or ring, don't just walk in. And this dog had bitten a couple of people, so his life was on the line. Um, on the right-hand side is a dog that was having some reactivity issues too. And so they made the sign, laminated it, and um, they had people grabbing treats on the way in to help train their dog. And they would put treats in a little um, 
container if they knew someone was coming over. So putting up signs can help manage your environment. Let's talk about the Tower of Power, particularly with dogs who are um, reacting. If your dog is reacting on walks or outside, there's a really good chance they're, they're reacting from inside. And I get a lot of calls from people who want work with their dog in public, but we have to start with what's, hap with what's happening at home. Because if your dog is looking out the window and barking 10 or 20 or 30 times a day at people going by, that same behavior then goes with them on walks and in cars. So it's really, really important to manage your dog at the house. For me, looking out the window is a privilege. Some dogs can have it, some dogs can't. But if they're barking at people, I would encourage you taking that away. And a client once called that her dog's tower of power. And I love that word. And I said, I'm gonna take that word because it's exactly what it is. They sit kind of in their little tower, looking out, surveying their kingdom and waiting for things to bark at. So eliminating sentry posts is something that's really important for a lot of reactive dogs. So this dog is totally on duty, okay? Here's a couple of other pictures of dogs, clients that I've worked with. So on the photo on the left, these dogs, you know, are sitting on a bed looking out and that's where they sit and watch and bark and then they turn on each other. The dog on the right too. I can, this is funny, but I can often tell when a dog uses a couch as a tower of power because I'll look and the whole couch is like depressed. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm guessing that's where he sits and looks out the window or sometimes there's two depressions for two dogs. Okay, so here's a whole bunch of ideas for blocking sentry posts. And sometimes we um, rearrange furniture, sometimes we um, change the configuration. We can block access to the, to the Tower of Power or we can block the view out the window. So here's a whole bunch of different ideas if you're looking for um, things to do. And I'm not gonna go through all these things, but some of them I have pictures of. And since this is recorded, Michelle, you'll be able to, you know, we can get these slides to people too. So here's some ideas for you. Um, a baby gate can be used. The one on the left has a hole so the cat can come and go, but the dog can't get into that room um, and look out the window. Blocking your tower power can be as simple as putting up paper. So this picture on the right, they just took copy paper and taped it to the window. And I'll tell people, try it, see if it works. And if it does, then you can look for something more aesthetically pleasing, like bottom up, top down blinds or something more decorative. Um, I have a lot of clients who tell me that barking is eliminated at a minimum of 50% just by blocking off the dog's tower of power. And frequently people tell me that their dogs are just a lot more relaxed when they eliminate their sentry posts. They just lay down. And basically we're taking them off duty. It is not your job to guard our house anymore. Carpet runner can be used. That's that stuff that you put on top of carpet and you put the spikes up. So on the left is a couch and the carpet runner would keep the dog off the couch. If you have someone over, if you're sitting on the couch, you can roll it up. On the right picture is carpet runner in front of a window. Um, I've had some clients have really great success with that. So you roll out the carpet runner, if the dog steps on it, it doesn't feel good on their feet and they're no, no, no longer jumping in front of the window. Um, on the left, um, this dog's tower of power was a couch in their family room and they just put a couple of these really pretty screens up. And so if they're in that room training the dog, the dog can be in there. If they're not in that room, it's completely blocked off by the screen and they've seen huge improvement <clears throat> by eliminating their dog's tower of power. It was the front window in the family room. So this is a nice decorative option um, and the dog is respecting it. On the right is a product um, on your list. It's called Gila Window Film. You can buy this at Lowe's or Menards. It's probably the most frequent thing that people use to block their dog's tower of power. Here's what it looks like. Um, it comes in different patterns. It comes at different widths. It is not an adhesive product, it's a static product. So there's a spray that you put on and then this attaches to it, but it's not like your window's all gummy and it takes forever to get it off and you have a big mess, it peels right off. So it's called Gila Window Film. It will let light in, um, but it'll block your dog's view. So on the picture on the right, this particular family lives on a corner, you can see the street back there. 
and the dog would sit at this uh, sliding glass door and bark out the window. So he's not doing that anymore. The film has really worked well and they can still open and close their screen door. So we're looking at how can we block their view? How can we block where they bark from? Take them off duty. Um, down the line, if you see improvement, then you can eliminate that. But as I said, if a dog's barking repeatedly in the house, there's a good chance they're gonna do that same thing in the car or on your walks too. So we have to start with this. Okay, um, on the left side is a, a big baby gate. People will say, gosh, I can't block access to that room where he barks out of because it's an open concept. Um, on the bottom is a website in the company of dogs. They have some really lovely, attractive gates. And I really like this one because it spans, you can tell it's a big area and it spans that whole area. And so they can, if they're in the room training, they open the gate. If they're not in the room training, then the gates close. So it blocks the dog's access you can see the windows are low. So where the dog would sit is right in front of that window and bark at people. The picture on the right, my client took poster board and just put like some wrapping paper on it. So it's, it's that simple. I've had clients take cardboard and put wrapping paper over the top in a pattern they like. So it can be really inexpensive or you, know, you can get bottom up top down, down blinds which are more expensive. Okay, so... Um, Okay, and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes even with our best efforts, our dogs um, decide that they're gonna go where they wanna go anyhow, but we, we keep looking for options. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about managing the dog and the handler. So, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about shot collars and, and why I don't recommend using aversives, especially as a starting point, um, but it's not something that I re recommend doing in working with your dog, especially with reactivity. And we'll talk about why in a few minutes. The other thing for me, when you have this picture on the right for me, um, if you have a dog who's reactive, I really encourage people you know, to be fully present. You know, we really want to be aware of the environment, aware of what's going on, um, not distracted. The, the more focused we are on our dog, the more proactive we can be in our timing and the more we can help them out to be successful and not to fail. So, um, you know, leave your Starbucks at home and, and your cell phone in your pocket. Okay. Under the concept of management, um, I love this picture. This is one of the, um, this is Ken, one of the board members of the Scotty rally, and he's doing a really great job. He's got his dogs confined, and this picture was taken at the Scotty rally, but his dogs are confined. He's giving them really good treats, and they're focusing on him and not worried about what's going on around them. So he's doing a really great job of, um, con of managing them in the environment and setting them up for success, ultimately. And a big part of working with reactivity is as much as possible setting our dogs up to practice behavior that we want and minimizing their chances to practice behavior we don't want, okay? Um, under managing the dog, we can look at the locations of the crates. Um, I don't encourage putting crates by front doors if you're working with reactivity. You want them either in a room this, the one on the left is in a back hall, the one on the right is in a family room. So we want crates and enclosures away from the front door where people come in if you're working in the house. Um, for some dogs, covering the crates um, really helps a lot as well. Okay, let's talk about tools and equipment. Um, I love, uh, these are some of the things that I, that I really like. Gentle leaders for me are one of my go-to pieces of equipment for any dogs with reactivity. I'll show you a video on those in a moment. Um, sensation or easy walk harnesses, those are front attach harnesses where the harness attaches on the chest. Um, if you go online and look up nervous dog or reactive dog collars and leashes, um, those can be really helpful. Clients tell me that if they have like a vest or a collar or a leash that says nervous dog or give me space, that people tend to um, heed that and it may slow them down or they may not come up and try to pet the dog. So if you're working on reactivity, especially in public, um, those types of things can be really helpful. There's a product called a thunder cap, previously called a calming cap, 
I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Those can be used um, in the house. I have clients who use them in vehicles. Um, they can also be used out in public. I have one client who used one um, at agility trials. It just helped to calm her dog down. Um, muzzles, I have some clients that we um, condition a muzzle. Some people find that they're a lot more relaxed if their dog is muzzled because um, they know their dog won't get in trouble with their teeth. Um, Shereg Patel is a trainer and he has some really great videos on introducing muzzles and making it into a, a big game. Uh, muzzles are something that you want to introduce gradually and make it fun. Um, and then they can be used in public or veterinary visits, um, et cetera, especially if it if helps you be more calm. And some dogs are more calm with a muzzle on. I did a workshop a few years ago on, private, or on positive veterinary visits and people laughed at my dog because she was sitting there wagging her tail with a muzzle on. And all she's ever known the muzzle as is fun and games and she gets food. So we do a lot of conditioning. I've never had to use it at a veterinary clinic, but if I do, we're set to go. So we wanna make a muzzle into something fun and positive um, and not make it into a big deal. Um, other helpful equipment are leashes with a traffic lead. So you can hold your dog right by your side. Max and Neo has a really nice leash. I'll so show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, for gates, uh, here's that website again with the nice, if you wanna look at a gate that's more attractive and not so industrial looking, um, in the company of dogs has some really nice ones. Okay, so if you're not familiar with gentle leaders, on the left is a gentle leader, and I do prefer that brand. Um, there are some other brands, Halty, there's a Snoot Loop, there's a couple different brands. Gentle Leader is the one that I prefer myself. There's a loop over the nose, there's a clip under the muzzle. The leash attaches below the muzzle on the chin and behind the ears. You get a lot of control with very little work. It also controls their head, which for working with a lot of reactive dogs, their head drives all the behavior. You know, they're barking, they're lunging. The gentle leader just gives you the ability to control them. On the right at the top is a leather traffic lead. You can buy these where, you know, your dog would be right by your side. The leash on the right, I really like a lot. It's by Max and Neo. Um, it comes in a couple of different lengths. It has a padded handle. And you can see that there's a second loop right down by the end of the leash. So you can either have your dog at a longer distance or if you want them right by your side, that handle allows you to hold them um, right at your side and not have to choke up on the leash. Or, you know, I have clients that, that may not have um, great movement in their hands. So they like having that handle to hold on to that's all padded on the bottom. It's also a nice soft nylon. Okay, I wanna show you a couple of videos and a key piece of controlling dogs that are reactive, either in or out of the house, um, or a key piece is having control of them. Um, I wanna show you three really short videos. This is one dog on three different pieces of equipment. And I just want you to see the level of control. If you've never worked with a gentle leader, sometimes people are, when I suggest it, they're like, really, that's gonna help me. But I just want you to see the difference. So the first video, is um, the, the dog on just a martingale collar. So pulling a ton, and it's a pretty big dog. Doesn't have a lot of training. He's a big plot hound mix. This dog was at the Humane Society, but they were nice enough to let me tape him. So that's the martingale collar. And we did all these um, pieces of equipment in succession one after another. So here's the front attached harness. Better, right? A Little bit better control. <laughs> Can you hear the volunteers saying, yeah, when we get going, she'll maybe calm down a little bit. <laughs> so this is better than the martingale collar. Okay, and here's the same dog with the gentle leader. Right by my side, hardly pulling at all. Okay. And I should tell you guys um, on the videos, I don't think we have um, audio with the videos, so I will be narrating the videos. Um, but that gives you an idea what a difference equipment can make. 
So if you have a dog who's reactive, we want better control. Um, and a key piece of working with dogs is having you as the handler feel like you have control, especially with bigger dogs. So the more relaxed you are, the more, con the more confident you're gonna be, the easier it is gonna be to work with your dog and, and help them in situations that are problematic. So general leaders can be used out on walks. They can be used in the house too. I have clients who use them when they're having their dog uh, greet other people. Okay, on the left is a calming cap, uh, now called thunder cap. So the dogs can still th see through. It's kind of semi-opaque. These come in different sizes. They're about $20, I think. They're not real expensive. I have the website at the end that you can pick those up. So this is a dog um, who is having reactivity issues in the car. And, um, and so we started using a calming cap and that was their preference over having the, the dog couldn't be crated. So in a car, you can certainly put the dog in a crate and cover it, but the calming cap, you know, for me, it's worth experimenting. It does take some conditioning, um, but I've had some clients tell me that in certain situations, their dog actually kind of asks to have it put on, like they get it that it helps them calm down. So it's, it's still um, a little bit opaque, but it just blocks their view. And if you think of people with horses will do this, they'll cover the head. People who do like falconry, they cover the hawk's head and cover their eyes and the animal calms down. Um, on the right is a nervous dog collar. I'll encourage people get a little bit wider one. This is a client I worked with and her dog had bit multiple people and he was a super cute dog. So people wanted to come up and um, it really helped. She said that people at least pause or they keep a little bit more distance. Um, and I think she had a vest that went with that too. So there's a lot of products. If you do a search on nervous dogs or aggressive dog collars and leashes, there's all kinds of options. There's give me space, there's nervous, there's all kinds of options for you. Okay, all right. So when we're working on behavior modification, um, here are a couple of goals for us. Um, we wanna improve the dog's response. The bigger piece is we wanna change how the dog feels about people who are new or coming to the house. We have to keep the dog below the threshold of reacting as much as possible in your work. Um, we want to keep your dog at the point where they're not barking, they're not lunging, they're not reacting. Occasionally we cross that line, but the more you can stay below that threshold, the more you're going to see behavioral changes. We gradually increase their level of comfort. Um, one of my mantras with my clients is I'd rather have your dog be successful from a distance than to fail up close. Okay. Um, we also want to build the dog's ability to take direction from their person and to build trust that you will take care of the situation. We really want your dog to trust. And one of the things I see with people in working with reactive dogs is they put the dog over a threshold and they might do something like hold the dog really tight and let people pet them. That doesn't change how the dog feels about the situation. And sometimes dogs start to, we never know for sure what dogs are thinking, but my interpretation is that the, the dog thinks, I can't count on my person to handle this for me, so I have to handle it on my own. Um, so we want people to be aware of what their dog can and can't handle, and for the dog to trust that. I can kick back, mom's gonna take care of this. They're not going to let people get too close. They're not going to let people do things that we know bother me while we work on this. Okay. And my other goal with my clients is to build their confidence that they have the tools to address situations. Okay. I tell people often in classes and appointments, part of my job is to help them start to think like a trainer because um, I'm not always going to be there. So I want them to start to think like a trainer and give them tools that they feel like, yep, we, we've got this. Okay, um, avoid flooding. Flooding is when you present too much to people. So an example I often use is like, if you were afraid of spiders and I put one in your lap, would that help you get more comfortable with spiders? Probably not. There's a percentage of people that it might because it'll never be worse than this, but there's a bigger percentage of people that they might actually get worse or sensitized. So sometimes in their effort to desensitize a dog, people actually sensitize them by allowing them to be over threshold and having the situation be too much for their dog. 
So flooding is just giving the dog, basically saying, oh, he'll get over it. Okay. Um, so we want to avoid flooding. We want to keep them below that threshold, keep the situation at a level that the dog can handle. So we don't run the risk of making them worse. Okay. Um, let's talk about what about positive punishment? Um, positive punishment is basically an aversive. So with positive punishment, you're adding something negative to the situation. Examples about of those would be pinch collars, e-collars, all these different um, devices. Um, in general, with reactivity, that is not where I start. We start with the most positive methods. If I have a dog who's more offensive, in other words, coming from a place of power and control and wanting to be in charge, I may consider adding some of these, others not, never. Um, with a dog who's coming from a place of fear, there's a good chance that any of these kinds of things will make them worse. And I work with a fair amount of dogs that people come to me and they've already tried many of these devices. Uh, I'm saddened by how many people buy a shot collar before they come and see a person like me. And they've actually done damage to their dog, especially if there's fear. Um, so with any aversives, you run the risk of the dog pairing something negative with the shock, the vibration, the tone, et cetera. So with some of these devices, at best you suppress behavior, but at worst you can make it worse. Um, when the dog pairs, I just worked with a dog where they were using a, an e-collar and I had to explain to them from the dog's perspective, you think you're correcting the barking and lunging, but what the dog learns is when people approach, bad things happen. So I need to work harder to keep people away. So with any aversive, you run the risk of adding, um, adding or making the situation worse. Um, even if it does help, sometimes what happens, so I recently had client that they added a, um, a vibration collar and they said, oh my gosh, he's so much better. And I said, so what happens when you take it off? Well, he, bar he still barks. So what they done with the collar, they were suppressing the behavior, but it still didn't change how the dog felt about the situation. So I said, we have to address this from a training perspective and start to teach the dog, you know, this is what we want. So you've suppressed the behavior with the collar, but you haven't changed how he feels about it, nor have you changed the behavior when the collar's off. It's a, it's a strong discriminative, it's, it, the dog could discriminate. Um, so so uh, we will, it's not my first choice. It's something I may consider at some point, okay? So let's talk about um, working with dogs who react on territory. We work on building the, the owner's leadership. We work on building um, confidence for shy dogs that uh, people having visitors over is a good thing. We use high value treats, high value toys to build a posi positive association with the presence of visitors. My goal is I wanna change these dogs attitude from get out of my house to OMG, people are over, great things are happening for me. I love it when we have people over. So we really wanna change how they feel. With a lot of my clients, we talk about increasing general training, inside, outside, and on walks. If your dog can't listen to you without distractions and nothing going on, they're not gonna to listen to you in the height of a moment when they're aroused. So a lot of my clients were working on really basic skills, like sit down, off, wait, stay, leave it, quiet, going to their room um, for when doorbells ring, uh, we use hand signals and verbal cues. Um, I encourage most of my clients to confine their dogs if people come in or over when, they, when people enter and the dog is only brought, up, brought out on leash when they're calm. For a lot of dogs, all the drama happens around the door. So if we remove them from the door, wait till they're calm and then bring them out, many, many dogs do significantly better. It also sends a message of it's not your job to control access to the house. Um, leashes can also be used if you're home or outside. So a dog can trail a leash so that if they start to react, you can redirect them. Um, when we do bring the dog out, they're right by the owner's side or I have the owner back into the room and block their dog, asking for a sit, asking for some other behavior. So we're working on keeping the dog thinking. We don't come out of a room with the dog on a leash and let them blast ahead and bark. 
Um, we may let them greet the person gradually, or we may not be, we may not do it at all. Again, I'd rather have a dog across the room doing well with a visitor in the house than growling at them up close. Okay. Um, we, we teach dogs to be confined or crated when the owners are home. If the dog is always loose, but then they're crated or um, confined when people are over, when they first enter, they're gonna be stressed about that. So for some clients, I have them start when they're home um, to get the dog used to it. You might be crated or confined when we're home. We also experiment. Are they better if they greet inside or outside? Some dogs are way better if they meet people outside and then we all go in together. Um, if spaying or neutering is not done, I recommend it. Um, the dog's ability to recover is critical to their success. Recovery is a dog's ability to be um, concerned about something, but then get over it. So again, with strangers in the house, some dogs within five, 10 minutes, they're quite comfortable. Other dogs continue to react if the person gets up or they cross their legs or they go to the bathroom and come back. So the, the more quickly a dog recovers, the more successful people are in the long term. It's hard to work with dogs who, um, if you leave and go to the bathroom and come back, we start all over. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit about teaching leave it. And leave it is a really important skill for dogs to learn both on and off territory. I'm going to show you some videos on leave it. We teach it two ways. One where we toss a treat in front of the dog, one where we toss the treat behind the dog. Okay, and we teach the dogs leave it is to leave whatever you're going towards and focus on me. Leave it is different than drop it. Drop it is spit it out. Leave it is leave it alone. Okay, here's a couple of videos where we talk about leave it. And this is useful for dogs on territory and off. So here I'm gonna toss a treat behind and you see how she's looking at me and I'm gonna reward that. So I'm blocking her with my body, backing her up. My timing wasn't that great on that. I'm rewarding her afterwards. So this is a younger dog. This is a um, Chessie, Chesapeake Retriever. So she looks down, she goes through my leg, but then she backs off and I'm gonna reward her for that. So with leave it, we start on leash, but our ultimate goal is to be able to do this off leash. Okay, so here's a second video where I'm gonna to toss the treat out in front of her and work with her. So she goes towards it, I tell her leave it. The instant her head turns, I back up and reward her. So I wanna teach her, you can be focused on thing, but then come back to me. Yay, good girl, nice job. I like teaching leave it to all dogs. It's one of my favorite cues to teach because there's just so many practical applications to it, but it's really critical for dogs who are reactive. <clears throat> You'll notice I'm not pulling on the leash. I'm waiting for the dog to make the choice because our ultimate goal is to be able to do this off leash. <clears throat> that time she doesn't even move forward. She comes back to me. Okay, so leave it is a really important skill for dogs that are giving us any kind of reactivity. <clears throat> All right, so when we're working with barking at windows, um, one of the cues I work with a lot of my clients on is teaching them quiet or teaching them to go to a room or teaching them to go to a mat. Okay, so key piece, we talked about perching spots. Um, unless the owner's present and teaching new behaviors, we eliminate dog doors. I am not a big fan of dog doors because I see so many dogs that go blasting out and barking at people. But we start to teach quiet. Um, in multi-dog households, we teach it separately and then together. And I want the clients working daily on this. 
And we use super high value treats for this work because it's really hard. Our goal is to have a dog who stops barking on request. So if they start barking, you can tell them quiet. And I have my clients make a list of when is it acceptable for the dog to bark and when isn't, isn't it? And they set their own criteria. I'm not gonna go through all the details of um, each week. This is a four, or a four week program that I give people. Um, gradually building up the dog's ability to be able to either stop barking or not even start barking. And this will be hopefully available afterwards, maybe on slides. But we start from on leash with making it really easy. The owner's there knocking on the door and the dog can see that we're working on quiet. By the fourth week, we're having them off leash and practicing with them. In an ongoing way, I encourage owners um, to verbally praise any instance that they can identify that the dog might normally bark at. So let's say the neighbor's car door slams and they don't bark. Good quiet, good job. And we praise and treat the dog. Um, I also have guardians maybe initiate noises. So they might tap on a wall, drop an item. Um, so they set up scenarios to praise and treat their dogs. Okay, or I'll have them talk to the neighbors and set up, hey, at 5.30, would you slam your car door? <laughs> so they have a chance to start practicing in a controlled setting, having their dog not bark. Um, we also work on, we work on quiet and we teach dogs to go to a room or a crate when they hear a doorbell knock or ring. And those two things can be trained simultaneously. So here's a couple of videos. These are some Westies. Um, in the first video, <clears throat> we're working on quiet. So they hear the doorbell. We're working on leash at this point. So I'm saying quiet. And the dogs are coming over and just saying, what would you like me to do? So this is, I think on our second appointment, they had a lot of foundation work that they did. The goal is when you hear a doorbell, you come to me and look for leadership. And they barked a couple times, but that was quite good. In the second video, we're teaching the dogs when they hear a knock or a ring, that they can go to a place on cue. So that can be a room, that can be a crate. In this case, it was the kitchen. They had a baby gate in the kitchen. So we're teaching the dogs if they hear a knock or ring, immediately they can go to their place of confinement. And we do this over about a month's worth of exercises. So you, they heard the doorbell and off she goes and you can see the kitchen. So then the owner's gonna follow behind her and shut the kitchen door. So ding dong, kitchen. The dog goes to the kitchen, they shut the door, then the owner would come and answer the door and determine if they were gonna bring the dogs out or not. One of her goals long-term was to be able to teach her dogs to go to a mat. So ding dong, go to a mat, and then the dogs would be released to greet if she wanted to. So here we are just working with the two dogs. Anything with multiple households, the, the cues are taught separately and then together. So she releases them and says, okay, which means you're free to go. So this is the beginning of her work, just starting to teach the dogs to go to the mat. So she's using the cue spot. So she gives them a cue, they go to their spot. This is a more advanced cue. Most of my clients are happy with being able to knock a ring and send their dog to a room or send their dog to a crate or send them to, um, you know, a back door. Going to a mat is more advanced work and it requires more diligence on the owner's parts because of course you have to be watching the dogs when your company comes in. And the more reactive your dog is, the more likely it is that they'll do best if they are um, put away and brought out when they're calm. But some get to this point. Okay, we work on waiting politely at the door. So wait and then release. You're not just allowed to go blasting out the door. Um, especially if your dog's reacting outside. Okay, um, these are a couple of videos that I'm working with a dog in the house. They're pretty quick. This is a dog who was reacting on and off territory and had bitten people. This is a video from um, 
our second appointment, the first appointment, I didn't touch her. I wasn't, or I wasn't even on the same side of the room with her. But this is our second appointment. Um, she's not on a choke chain. The choke chain is used because she, you can see it's attached to the collar. She sometimes bites her leash. So we've inserted a choke chain at the bottom of the leash. But she's actually just on a regular collar. So we're starting to shift how she feels about people in her house. Dad's giving her treats. I'm tossing treats. I'm not touching her yet. But she's starting to change how she feels. The, the first appointment, it was really quite scary. It was barking, lunging, really unhappy that I was in the house. So he, the owner's praising her. I'm praising her. She's getting lots of treats. She's thinking this is great. Um, we're working on my getting up and leaving. Um, what this, what would happen with this dog, the minute you got up and moved, she'd just go ballistic. So this is significant improvement. I think this is our second appointment. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about dogs who are off territory. So some of the same goals, building the owner's leadership, changing how the dog feels about people on walks. From get away from me to, oh my God, I really love you. Again, we use high value treats, high value toys. For some dogs, they're really big toy dogs. I had one shepherd who was a Frisbee nut. If people came over, we said, get your Frisbee and it totally shifted how he felt about people at our house. From, oh my God, you have arms, you'll throw my Frisbee for me. So for some dogs they're, who are really into toys, we can pull out a ball, we can pull out a Frisbee. I had one consult that they had a big bucket of tennis balls outside their house. And every time someone came over, they walked with an, in, a ball, in with a ball, totally shifted how their dog felt. Again, an increase in training is frequently recommended. And I have people work inside, outside, on walks. We want our dogs learning. All these cues are not limited to the family room, especially if you're having issues off territory. Um, owners work on walking their dog right by their side at least half of the time and moving their dog from one side to the other. Because if we're off territory, very frequently we're body blocking the dog or moving them to the opposite side. Any person at any distance is a trainable moment. And high value treats are used generously. So often people will say, yeah, but he's not reacting at that guy who's mowing his lawn. And I say, exactly. So we need to mark that and reward it. So any person at any distance for these guys is a trainable moment. If they look at someone and don't react, yay, good, leave it, or good, quiet, or just yay. Okay, we also work on watch. We may work on sit, stay. There's a book called Controlled Unleashed by Leslie McDevitt. Um, she has some really, really great exercises to work on for reactivity too. Um, we often use body blocks when passing people, along with the leave it cue and picking up the pace. A lot of these guys do much better if you pick up your pace. If you slow down, it gives them time to be concerned or worried and react. So we keep the dogs right by your side, move them to the opposite side. We may use treats or toys before, during, or after. Depends on the dog. Um, sometimes if you give a treat, you slow down and you lose the dog's focus. So some dogs do better if we give the treat afterwards. So we play around with that. I have a lot of clients that we do work from a distance. So I may send them to festival, Petco, PetSmart, sit in their car and watch people. Work on leave it, work on look at that and treating them. It's a safe way to practice with people of all shapes, sizes, colors, hats, beards, et cetera. Um, and you can control the distance. So you can sit at the back of the parking lot or move closer. It's a great way to practice and keep them sub threshold. Okay. All right, um, so I wanna show you a video. This is um, a Scotty and she is really, really shy. She made great progress with her owners. She is off leash, but we're working on um, her owner, just giving her treats, keeping her thinking. So a key piece of working with these guys and key is keeping them thinking and keeping them out of the emotion. So mom's just doing up, you can see her tail is down, so she's not totally comfortable. But mom's giving her treats and she's near me. 
First time I met Mary Claire, she didn't come out of a crate. So she's getting better and more comfortable with people. So I'm just off. I'm not really, really doing anything. The treats are all coming for mom. And we're just letting her approach if she wants to. Mom redirects her. I'm not touching her. I'm not reaching towards her. I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting there. And we're just letting her come up to me if she wants to. She looks back to mom. So now her tail pops up. Later on, we may add me tossing treats, but at this point, she's pretty sensitive um, to movement of arms. So I'm keeping my hands in and the treats are happening with mom, but with me there. Again, every dog is different. So there she comes up and says, hey, I think you might be okay. Okay, uh, the next video is just a brief clip of um, a sensitive dog class. And this is, these are dogs who are reactive to people and dogs. We're practicing walking by. So the owners, you can see their body blocking, the dog is on the opposite side. And we're practicing walking by other dogs and other people. So these are all dogs who are having reactivity issues towards people or dogs. Okay. Okay. So in conclusion, as we're working with these dogs, um, all behaviors can be improved. I really encourage people be proactive, address problems early. So as soon as you start having issues, get help. Don't be afraid to seek the help of a professional and don't do that as a last resort, do it early on. Um, I can't tell you how many people come to me and they've talked to friends, neighbors, coworkers, the internet, and they finally come and say, I just need someone to give me a program for my dog. Every dog is different. What works with one dog doesn't work with the next. So don't be afraid to seek out the help of a professional. Um, we talked about no e-collars. Keep your dog below the threshold of reacting as much as you can and have a good time. It's really rewarding when you see these dogs start to improve. Um, I have a couple of resources for you. Here, IAABC and APDT, they have consultant locators. There's some books listed here. Dogwise, if you've never been on dogwise.com, get your wallet open. They have videos, DVDs, um, books on anything related to dogs. It's a really fun website. Okay. <clears throat> um, here are some more resources. Control Unleashed by Leslie McDevitt, as I mentioned, that's a really great book. The Power of Positive Training is just a good general book on training. Okay, um, this is a list of upcoming seminars that will be offered by the Door County Scotty Rally on Zoomies. Um, if you like the Door County Scotty Rally Facebook page, you should get updates on what's coming up and the scheduled talks. Um, Michelle said at the beginning that they have talks lined up for a year. So um, this is a great series. and. Um, if you don't are not familiar with the Scotty Rally, they raise money for research and rescue. And they've raised how much money, Michelle? A lot of money over the years that they've been doing fundraisers. $434,000 in the yeah. last 20 years. So they do really, really good work. So these are what's coming up and you are welcome to join in on any of those Zoomies. Okay, if you're interested in donating to the Scotty Rally, here's information on don um, donating, DC Scotty Rally at Gmail, and you can donate through PayPal. This is a fully volunteer organization. There's no paid staff whatsoever. Okay, um, here's my contact information. You are welcome to call, email. Um, I'm happy to answer questions or work with you. Okay. And we wanna thank you guys for attending today and giving up your time on this Saturday morning. We really appreciate your being um, here with us. 
Okay, whoops. And I think um, the plan at this point is to open up for questions. I think Matt's going to be facilitating this, so he will be he will take your questions from chat, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. We've scheduled this for um, an hour presentation and then about half an hour Q and A. So if we have questions, we'll we'll go ahead and answer anything that you that you have. Okay. So, so Jody, we have a question uh, from the chat box. Um, our dog is overly excited when she sees cows while in our car. What can we do? Oh, sure. Cows? Cows, yes. But I guess that could apply to anything. So what about, yeah. are, there, are there shields or would you yeah. recommend films or so, things like that for car? Yeah, and so an easy fix for things like that is to put your dog in a crate and cover it and just eliminate the visual. Um, the calming cap can be a great resource for that. A lot of, for a lot of dogs who react in cars, I recommend a seatbelt harness, especially if they're running back and forth. So, you know, some dogs get lamped up and they run back and forth from window to window. So I'll recommend a seatbelt harness. That would also be a scenario where I would teach leave it and or quiet. And I would go sit outside of a field and park. You know, it's hard to drive and train your dog, you can't. But I would look for some cows in a place where I could sit and just work on that. I've done that with squirrels. I had one dog that you know would pull my arm off if he saw squirrels. So we worked on some basic training. And then I went down to the university where there are tons of squirrels and we sat on a bench and just worked on leave it and taught him what I wanted. So a big piece in working with this, these issues is rewarding what you want. So again, with the, with the cows, we'd control our distance. So I might, um, I might park as far enough away as it took for my dog to be successful and just start to work with that. So sitting still, and then we'd introduce driving. So hopefully that gives you um, some cues to help. That could be a situation where I may consider adding something like a pet corrector or a squirt bottle, but I wouldn't start with that. I'd start with taking some really great treats, working on leave it and rewarding the heck out of them if you wanted to address the training. As I said, sometimes management is easy. We're gonna put you in a crate and cover it and that just makes it a non-issue or put you in a seatbelt harness where you can't see out, so. Thanks, Jody. We have another question from somebody about a gentle leader. They have it in a size small already, but it keeps slipping off. Uh, they've done positive association training inside, but when they go outdoors with the dog, they paw, they try to paw it off and we'll get it off themselves. Is there something that they can do with yeah, that? Yeah, so do we, know what, do we know what kind of a dog it is? Um, it doesn't say, this is from Lori uh, Loper. Scotty, is this the Scotty? Oh, sorry, it does say Scotty, sorry. Oh, it's so a Scotty, small, okay. So usually if it's coming off, it's not adjusted properly. So I would check the fit. So um, if you can see this, the nose loop should be adjusted so if you pull it down, it just comes to where their nose goes from fur to skin. If you can pull it off the end of their nose, your Scotty can too. So I would adjust first the nose loop and then test it. And you can pull down pretty good and hard. And that's as far as it should come to about here. Um, you can also check the back part should be adjusted so that um, you can just get one to two fingers underneath. So you can check that adjustment as well. So typically if they're pulling it off, it's just that it's a little bit too loose. Um, one thing I'll recommend is if they start to paw is just to pull up on the leash, try pulling up or try just pulling forward and just saying, let's go and continue to move. Sometimes with a gentle leader, if you stop and try to um, if you stop, they just keep pawing and they, it gets worse. So sometimes I'll just say, let's go and just keep going. So hopefully those two things will, will help you. For some dogs, treats can help with this where we might, um, oh, I didn't bring, I don't have any treats, where we might take a treat in front of their nose and just bring them along to prevent them from pawing. So with gentle leaders, I tell my clients, 
Um, there's, whoops. Uh, what happened? Uh, uh, somebody else is trying to share their screen here. It said someone, okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so I do tell clients, some dogs you put the gentle leader on and it's no big deal. Some dogs you get a little bit of drama. Some you get like alligator death rolls and a lot of drama. Um, most dogs, if you, after about four to six times, it just becomes something, um, a piece of equipment that you use. I do have some clients who tell me my dog isn't a huge fan of this gentle leader, but I am um, because it just gives you better control. So I would say if you haven't introduced it that much, you know, persist and see for a lot of dogs, they do get better and better and better. But if they're kind of pawing, just say, let's go, keep your voice light and keep moving, pull up or pull forward. Don't stop and see if that seems to help bring some treats along and you know, the minute they move forward, yay, nice job. So we make it into more of a party with them. Um, sometimes with gentle leaders, it's the loss of control that frustrates dogs and just having something on their face. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that helps you, Mary. Uh, but, but yeah, step one, would be, step one would be checking the fit. It's my niece, it's not okay. me. Yeah, usually, yeah, usually, um, Usually the first thing I do if people are using one is check the fit because usually it's too loose. It's usually not too tight. And if they're pulling this nose loop off, that's the place to start is checking the adjustment on that. And, and I'll tell people really put, give it a good pull and you shouldn't be able to pull it off the end of their nose. Okay. Jody, we have another question here from somebody who has an entire clan of Scotties that they're trying to walk at the same time. So what do you, what would you recommend if someone's trying to walk four Scotties at the same time? Uh, they react to cars, trucks, other dogs, people, and when they get going, they will sometimes like take it out on each other. So. Oh yeah. Yep. So over. general leaders would certainly be helpful in that scenario. I, in general, if you have multiple dogs in your household, start working with them separately because they feed off of each other often. Um, and the reaction that you'll get from four dogs is usually a lot greater than you'll get for one at a time. So, you know, the bad news is for me with four dogs is I would start working with them separately, then maybe two together, or maybe we work on them separately, but then we walk together with a second person and we each have two. So if they can't do it individually, they're not going to do it as a group. So we'd start separately, then maybe two at a time then maybe a third and ultimately the fourth, but you could break it down, as I said, to having multiple handlers. That way, all you have to worry about is, um, is your own two dogs. And I would pair, when you start pairing them, pair the dogs that are most likely to get along or the dog that's doing best with the dog that's not doing as well. So the pairing for me would be um, important. But if they're not on a gentle leader, that would certainly give you a lot better control. My guess is very often, uh, my question would be, are these guys doing this at home at Windows too? Actually, she says uh, later on, she has another thing here that says they all hang out by the windows. Yeah. And one in particular is a bad barker. Um, and she said she, it might make the others sad to block the windows from all of them. Um, too bad, so sad. Yeah. Too bad, so sad. <laughs> But you did, and you did mention earlier that if the behavior improves, you could potentially yes, like yes. lower the blockage or j just decrease or take it away in, 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 once they're behaving. Yeah, and I, um, I say, I would say, you know, I have a lot of clients that feel bad about taking the view out of the window, but you know what? I'll, I live in a 50 year old ranch house that has taller windows. And I don't see my dogs like moping at the base of the windows, like, oh, our life sucks because we don't have a window to look out of. You know, they don't, they deal with it. And, and looking out a window for me is a privilege. And very, some dogs can have it, but some dogs can't. And if they're barking, then it goes away. For a lot of my clients, I tell them this may not be forever, it, but at least, at least I usually look at three to four months where we take away their tower of power if they're doing well then we might start doing some training sessions where we take down the block, but we're right there teaching them what we want. 
But the first thing for me is we have to take them off duty. We have to calm them down. We have to teach them it's not your job to bark at everything that goes by. And as that improves, you will probably begin to see some improvement on walks because it's the same behavior. It's just different location. You're just removing the window and adding a leash. It's this exact same behavior. So don't feel bad. Um, if you take away the tower of power and they look mopey, I have a ton of clients that I write a big note that says, don't buy into their drama because sometimes they around and look like you've just, you know, destroyed them but it's like it's the eyes how can you resist the I eyes know. i know i can't tell you a good percentage of my clients have a note that says don't buy into the drama they have a great life with you um but it's really common to have all, all several at the window or all at the window usually you have a ringleader who starts it and then everyone joins in and then sometimes we turn on each other and it's just awful and then that translates into going outdoors or being in the backyard. So that behavior just mushrooms into lots of other areas. So um, for the four dogs that are reacting on walks, step one for me, we've got to get a handle on what happens in the house because they're practicing that. If they're practicing it multiple times a day, it's not going to be better on walks. Then step two would be some of the things we talked about, increased training build their response. If they can't listen with nothing going on, it is not gonna happen in the height of a moment. We work on quiet, we work on leave it, we teach it one at a time, and then we start doing it in groups. And you know, whoever that is, you know, I'm certainly happy to work with you or you can join, um, you know, find a consultant locator um, on one of the websites I gave too if you need some help working individually. The more dogs you have in your house, the more important it is to have control and the harder it is to get it. You know, so the foundation of a lot of working with reactivity is starting to get our dogs to respond just to basic cues. And if they can't listen to you without a distraction, it won't happen with. Jody, so, we have a couple of comments please, here from Lori. I hope that helps. We have a couple of comments here from Lori talking uh, basically positive uh, positively saying that the uh, removing tower of power works uh, doesn't have to be forever. When the dogs learn to, uh, behavior, they, they were able to take it, give, give that back to them. And that, I thought this, this was interesting. She said, removing the tower of power uh, and teaching quiet also extinguished car barking with no work on our part. So yes, something that you're doing in one spot that carries over to other areas too. Correct. And that's a perfect example because if we think of the house window, the car is just the same thing. We just moved the behavior to a different setting. It's the same stimulus. I look out a window and bark. Most of my clients, if we just eliminate the tower of power, tell me that their dog's barking decreases by 50%. Sometimes it's 90%. It is life-changing for some of these dogs, but we step out of it too, and they're just not practicing behavior you don't want. And one thing to know too about cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone that our bodies produce. The more chronically stressed your dog is, the lower their threshold is for any kind of reactivity. And this is true for us too. If we're chronically stressed, it takes less for us to react negatively or in a way that we wouldn't normally. The lower our stress is, the bigger the difference is between where I'm living and my crossing over into arousal or whatever behavior it would be for a person. So when you have dogs who are sitting at a window and barking, time after time after time, their cortisol is just going through the roof. And even when they're sitting there, they're prime. They're waiting for stuff to bark at. They're on duty. <clears throat> so cortisol is up. So on a chemical level, when you eliminate the tower of power, you take down their level of cortisol, you bring down kind of their base point. So it takes more to have them cross over. If that may, I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, and a lot of people tell me when they eliminate the tower of power, their dogs are more relaxed when we take them off duty. They're more focused, they're more relaxed, they're just less edgy in general. <clears throat> we didn't even talk about medication in this, but I do have some clients that I encourage um, to put their dog on medication. And this is like a whole different topic, but the Westies in the video um, that I showed you, the three Westies that went to their room that we were working on barking, they were both on fluoxetine. Um, they had lots and lots of reactivity issues and multiple bites, and it was it was quite complicated. Um, and so they were put on Prozac. So I mean, we didn't even get into supplements and um, 
medication that can be used to facilitate some of these situations. <clears throat> Thanks, Jody. Um, we have a couple of comments here and actually a question uh, from my wife who's sitting next to me. But uh, somebody, before we go on to anything else, somebody has a comment of uh, thanking you, uh, Michelle and Jody, um, and asking if you could repeat the contact information for seminar payment in Door County rescue effort. Uh, Michelle, would you be able to send a, an email afterwards to, to attendees with, with the information so we don't have to do the, the Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so one of, one of the comments that we that kind of uh, skipped over, I wanna come back to. Um, so we all know that our Scotties have super short legs. Uh, Kathy says, I've used general leaders on my Scotties before. I found the location of the leash clip is so close to the front paws that on a couple of occasions, they disconnected the leash. Um, and I would say the one thing I thought of as I was thinking about that is maybe um, wrap it with like medical tape before you go out. Could be something that would stop if they did step on it. It's easy to get that, that medical tape off after it doesn't leave a lot of stickiness. Um, I don't know if Jody has any suggestions for it, but- yeah. I you can also look. You can also look at different kinds of clips. Um, a clip like this is less likely. Um, a clip like this is less likely to get opened up. Usually, the clips that um, and and the person who who sent this can tell us too. Usually, the clips that I don't even own a leash like this are the ones that kind of push in. So instead of being up and down like this, it's a clip that there's a piece that kind of pushes back and forward. And the person can tell us if that's the case. I do have some clients who add um, a second leash just for their own comfort. So they may add a second uh, short traffic lead or you know, a second leash just for their own comfort. So who was the person that asked that question? What was the leash? Does the leash have a clip like this? That was Kathy. Let me see if she's still here. Uh, looks like she's still here. Kathy, are you able to unmute yourself? It's been years. I don't remember what leash I used. What I did I do was get a nylon choke collar and added it to. So if the general leader came off, I still had a chance of hooking the dog? Sure. Yep. And we sh I showed that in that video on Sophie. One other thought for that too um, could be to have like a, let, this isn't a locking carabiner, but you could get a locking carabiner too um, that would attach and that way it, it couldn't open. But yeah, if if the clip was one of those that that the panel kind of pushes back, I've had that happen too, just even in classes where the dog's paw goes just right and it just pushes um, pushes back and allows the leash loose. So I really like um, this type of a clip on a leash. But thanks, that's a good point to bring up. Jody, I think um, <clears throat> sort of related to Tower of Power and uh, reacting to things that they're able to see, uh, my wife Roseanne had a question sort of similar to that, but a little bit different. So um, for us, the, the stimulation isn't visual of what he's seeing out the window, but it's auditory. It's what he's hearing of people, you know, slamming doors, walking around outside. You know, we live in a city, there's a lot of noise. Yeah. Um, what do you, you gave a lot of really good tips for blocking the visual stimulation, but what about audio stimulation that causes that same kind of sensory behavior? Yeah, so um, that is a scenario too, where we work on leave it and quiet. And um, we may, as I said, do practice sessions where we start slamming car doors. Good leave it, good quiet, and work on that. Um, so sometimes you can set up practice situations with what the stimuli is. Um, another common thing that dogs will react to is um, people walking by <coughs> and hearing conversations. That is also something that you can set up a practice session with, like have friends go by, hey, Bill, how are you doing? you know, and just shout something outside that the dog hears. Um, that can be a time where you may block access to certain areas. So, you know, if it's the front door that they hear, we may keep the dog towards the back of the house. That may also be a scenario like when you're gone that we crate the dogs or confine them um, 
either in the basement or a bedroom or more quiet part of the house so we don't have all the auditory stimuli. Um, you can use music, you can buy white noise machines as well. Apartments are really difficult for this. I work with some clients whose dogs have um, issues and apartments are terrible for this because there's doors slamming, there's, you know, or nurse or um, like assisted living places. I've had clients where there's door slamming and, um, um, you know, cars pulling up and just lots of extraneous noise. So, um, so we do our best to limit the noise and we may be more proactive in setting up practice sessions to teach what we want. So we may knock, you know, make a tapping noise, knock, 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 good quiet and reward the dog. So we start thinking like, I can't control these sounds, but how can I um, replicate them in my training sessions so we have a way to practice? Does that make sense? And I don't, yeah, I don't think, um, I don't think there are dog earmuffs, unfortunately. <laughs> I think that I think your answer also could help. Um, L. L. Hardy asked a question about um, her Yorkie only barking when the mailman FedEx uses their package scanner, and they've learned to wait for when they come uh, to to react to it. But um, I think the things you're saying about the auditory stuff could also help with that. And it feels oh, like yeah. a positive and, distraction uh, from from those times is yeah. And you know, you guys, I have to go online and look because I have a ton of clients who talk, especially in the pandemic who tell me that my dog knows the sound of the UPS truck, like he can hear it from a block away, or my dog knows the sound of the um, Amazon van or whatever. I have to go online and look up and see, because there are apps that you can get with the sound of doorbells. Um, there's a training uh, for desensitizing to sound. There's a training center. It's a legacy canine in Seattle, Washington. It's legacycanine.com. They have a whole series of DVDs. Um, it's their Sounds Good CDs. They've got babies, gunshots, um, fireworks, um, loud noises. They've got a whole series of DVDs that you can um, purchase for desensitization. But I have to go online and look up whether you can download the app, an app of a UPS truck or an Amazon truck. But my inclination would be, let's get let's get a copy of that sound and train it. So we hit, we hit the sound, you know, just like a doorbell, ding dong, quiet, good job. So it would be similar to teaching quiet, only you'd have that specific sound. So that might be asking your delivery person if you can tape them. <laughs> so you have your own copy of the sound or that may be, oh, they're here, I'm gonna tape this. Or there may be people who've already done it and you can get it online. I have to look that up. Um, because yeah, it's surprising how many dogs know the sound of the UPS truck or the FedEx truck and react to it. But again, if we block their access to the front, that's a scenario where we might have the dog trailing a leash when we're home. So as soon as they take off to that window, we step on the leash, we grab it, we redirect them. Early timing is really critical in all of this as much as you can. Um, uh, I just saw a comment that made me laugh. On a side note, I do have a pair of dog earmuffs for loud sounds. Oh, so apparently that, oh Jill is holding, holding up the earmuffs. For oh, look at that. Thanks for sharing. So where did you get those? I actually got them online. I uh, had my Scotty was a service dog for me. And I found these, they're for like uh, movie theaters or on the airplane if the noise is loud. The only thing is with ears upright dogs, they're very hard to put on because they fold the ear down. You know, they're supposed to fit tight. Yeah, and you know, Jill, that's a good point because I've actually looked up earmuffs and a lot of what I see is like stuff for dogs who are jumping out of helicopters like military training dogs, but those are really for, as far as I can tell, for really short-term use. Yes. So, and I think about, okay, if we were using this all the time during the day, if we live in a busy city or from four to six, would we, you know, would it be uncomfortable or would we cause problems like ear infections because we wouldn't have airflow? So that for me, like I, for me, it's like, yeah, for 4th of July or a thunderstorm or something more short-term, but maybe if you used it initially, then you could phase it out. So how long do you leave those on when you use them? So I only use them when we went to the movies 
um, because I felt like in there with the surround sound, it was way too okay. you know, noisy. So you've used it, but you haven't tried it on your dogs yet? No, I've used them on the dog in the movie theater. Oh, your dog. Okay. Yeah. The service dog. So it was a couple hours. Exactly. And then I felt, you know, I kept checking on them. I just felt they were too um, obtrusive, if you will, you know, because I don't like the fact that his ear was pushed up against him. So I don't know. I ended up not bringing him sometimes or we would just watch movies at home. So, yeah. And, you know, things like that, I look at um, it might help and it can't hurt. So there's a lot of things in training. I say, if it might help and it can't hurt, try it. It's time and money. Um, one thing that I've experimented with is what's called um, like a snood. It's something that's used in dog grooming. I don't have it down here, but they use it um, in dog grooming to protect the dog's ears or if they're bothered by the sound. And it kind of looks like, um, it's like a piece of fabric that just covers the dog's ears. And, um, so I've wondered if that might be something that, that could be used too. You can buy those online. It's called... Um, does, it, does it kind of look like a wide headband? I feel like I've seen it before. Or yeah, if we have time, yeah, I can go grab it. I have it in the closet and they come in different sizes. Um, it's called a... Um, yeah, should I go grab it? It'll just take me a second. Or should, we, or should I just mention that they're out let's, there? It's like it's... Um, the, the company you said, was it Snood? Is that what you said? It's, it's, yeah, let me, I'll go grab it. It'll just take a second. And Matt, when, um, after she's done with this, perhaps I, there's a question from Lisa. I think I saw about um, what kind of- that's, that's Yeah, it's since great. we're talking about it, I'd ask that. And then I think Kate's question is, really helpful too, because I've had that happen so many times where people don't want to listen to yes when you're trying to keep your dog away from their dog. So I have to say like, sometimes I'm like the mad scientist of products and my own dogs get to be like my, my testers. So here's what it's called. It says happy. Can you guys read that? It says happy hoodie. I it's can't hard, see. Hard to see with the light if you move it up or down a little bit. Okay, happy hoodie. And can you see the picture of the dog? Here, I'll, if I do that, is that better? There, perfect. There it's focused now. So they come in two different sizes. They weren't super expensive. So here's what it looks like. It's kind of like a neck gaiter. And the package that I got has one of two different sizes. And it's elastic and it just goes over their ears. And, and as I said, groomers use this to deafen the sound for blow dryers for dogs. So I know that they can be conditioned to wear them, but again, that would be more short-term use. But for me, it might be worthwhile to try. It wasn't, they weren't super expensive. The website is happyhoodie.com. And they come in different colors, I think, too. So this is something I bought, but I haven't experimented yet with my own dogs, but I want to. I just know that they, um, my dogs go for grooming. I just know that they do wear these when they're at the groomer, so they'll be used to them. So I wonder if this would muffle some sound for dogs, too. But again, the question would be, um, how long could you use them before it would get uncomfortable or you might run the risk of, of creating like an ear infection. So I think that's the challenge with sound. But training wise for me, I do, I do a lot of practice um, with clients where we set up sounds. As I said, I go out and slam your car door, have the neighbor slam their car door, um, you know, having people talk outside. So we do lots of practice sessions um, and this can actually be fun we can practice, we'll practice having people walk by when we're working, either friends or neighbors, or um, I may put on, on a hood or make my walk look weird or different. So we have a chance to start practicing to teach a new response. So, you know, going back to the whole Tower of Power, some of my clients, we, we eliminate the Tower of Power and just leave it at that. Some of my clients do wanna start training. And if the dog is reacting outside, then we absolutely start training but then we would maybe um, allow them visual when we're there training. 
Um, but if we're not training them, the, the block goes back up. Um, some clients have a goal of having the window back opened up. Some say, no, this is so much better. Um, we're just gonna um, leave the, the block up, whatever that is. Uh, but you can set up lots of practice sessions from people going by, um, people coming to the door, et cetera, just recruiting people to help you. Thanks, Jody. We have a question. Um, somebody's asking, is there a type of muzzle that you recommend for Scotties? Um, in general, I like the Baskerville muzzles for a basket muzzle. Um, a lot of my clients, again, if you're doing short-term use, you don't want to use... Or, Cloth, cloth or fabric muzzles are fine for very short-term use, like for a quick nail trim, um, or you know, I'm just gonna trim your bangs or something like that. If you're doing behavior work where the dog's gonna wear it for a longer period of time, you would wanna get a basket muzzle. Um, I like the Baskerville muzzles. You might also look up um, muzzles for Scotties, because sometimes there are reviews out there of people that have experimented with different muzzles for that breed to say this is better or that is better. If, if you don't know what a basket muzzle is, it is, um, it, it, it's like a cage that goes over their mouth so they can breathe, they can take treats. <clears throat> it's a lot more comfortable. Dogs only breathe through their mouth and through the pads, um, pads of their feet. So when their mouth is held shut with a cloth muzzle, um, there's not enough air exchange for long-term use. So we want to go with like a basket type muzzle. There are also people who do custom muzzles, you know, where you take some different measurements and then they make a muzzle specifically to your dog. But the Basker muzzle for a, a commercially available muzzle is nice. It's a rubber material. Um, so less likelihood that you're going to chafe or, or have it be uncomfortable with them. Um, it does take some conditioning. When I'm, when I'm conditioning muzzles, um, the first thing we do is take the muzzle and just put it on the ground and put treats in it and teach the dog to put their own mouth in the muzzle. I do have some videos of, of client dogs, but I didn't include them in this. But we put the muzzle on the ground and teach the dog to just put their face in it. Then the next step is we hold up the muzzle. If you imagine this is the muzzle and hold a treat and teach their dog to put the nose, their nose in the muzzle. Um, then we just put the strap around the back of their neck briefly. The last thing we do is clip it and build time. So this, for some of my clients, this may be over a month or six weeks, but my goal is to make it a, into a fun game and as much as possible, it's a behavior that the dog offers rather than something that's done to them, if that makes sense. And as I mentioned in the presentation, I do have some clients that, that either need to introduce a muzzle for, the, for veterinary visits or want to for their work. And they tell me that they're just more relaxed um, knowing their dog is muzzled, that they won't get in trouble with their teeth. The gentle leader is not a muzzle, but um, it does give you control of the head and you can cinch it down pretty tight, but it's not a complete muzzle. And um, I really encourage people, if you have a dog that will need muzzling at the vet clinic, absolutely get one. I, I encourage everybody to, to buy a muzzle and introduce it. And hopefully you'll never have to use it, but if you do, you're ready. And a story I share often, um, one of our shepherds hurt his foot um, in the backyard playing Frisbee. So we took him into the referral center. It's a Saturday. The first thing they ask is, do you mind if we muzzle him? He's walking on three legs. He's clearly in pain. We have to get x-rays of his foot. And I said, you do whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe. He never needed a muzzle before or after that for regular vet visits. But in that moment, I was so glad that I had introduced a muzzle. My only regret is I didn't think to bring my own. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh my God, my dog's on three legs, get to the referral center. And it never occurred to me to bring my own muzzle, um, which I, encourage people to do it, especially if your dog will routinely be muzzled. Have one of your own, take it with you. Um, you put it on, it's not a big deal. It smells like home and it smells like them and it's just not this weird smelling thing that's put on their face. But when you're introducing, make it fun, make it into a game so it's no big deal um, and practice it routinely. And that way your dog won't fall apart when you use it. Thank you, Jody. We have um, one last scenario question that, that I'd like to get to, but just a quick comment um, from 
Lori, since you mentioned uh, muzzle potentially for nail trimming, she said that she's used the Coleman cap um, right. on the study for nail trimming and it went incredibly well. But yep. the dog looks a little bit like Hannibal Lecter when wearing it. So that's just one thing you have to yeah. get, the, get, oh, over, get, over the, get over that and uh, give it a try. Um, so the last thing I want to get to, because I've had this happen, I don't know, 7 million times with my two Scotties and have one that is uh, particularly aggressive with other dogs. Um, this is from Kate. And she says, on walks, I try to avoid other dogs since my dog likes to lunge towards them. I'd like her to not react to other dogs when she sees them. Some owners will say, oh, he, she is friendly about their dogs. They'll let their dog run up to hers while she's trying to work on having the dog sit and watch and not react. What do you suggest to do in this situation or do to prevent it? She thought that the idea of that nervous harness that you showed earlier might help keep people away. Hmm. Um, yeah, I that... want to use a, a cattle prod or a, uh, some sort of shock device on the owner <laughs> of the dog, but I don't think you can do that completely. If they're just listening to uh, verbal cues, what do you do? Yeah, I know that's such a frustrating situation where you're like, really? You know, years ago, I had a really dog aggressive dog. And, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times the loose dog's running up and they're like, he's friendly. And I'm like, mine's not. Um, so, yeah, the nervous dog leashes can help. And I just want to go back for a second to the comment about the calming cap. Um, yeah, the, um, I put both names. It's now called the Thundercat, but it's I have the website on the resources list at the end. And those one of the common applications for those is for nail trimming. Like if you cover their face, um, they do calm down. So there are a lot of applications for that. And again, it's a cheap experiment. So I'm all for stuff that doesn't cost much money and it might help and it won't make them worse. But they do have to be introduced. But it is interesting, as I said in the presentation, I have a client who competed in agility and her dog would get very aroused and she introduced the calming cap and she'd use it going to the start line. He was a different dog. And she said he actually started tapping his nose on the calming cap, like he would ask for it. Oh like he actually knew that it really helped him. And she shared that with me. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I was glad she shared it. But going back to other dogs, yes. Um, we want our dogs to be able to count on us to get them out of situations that are too much for them. Um, and sometimes people come up and they behave in ways that are not appropriate and we feel bad being rude to them. So I would say, you know, don't, don't hesitate to be really firm. Don't hesitate to just get up and walk away if someone isn't listening and just say, no, you need to stand back. Don't be afraid to be firm with people, especially if your dog is reactive. You know, I have some clients that it's like their dog's life is on the line, you know, when we're working with them based on the history. And I said, don't you even for a second feel like you need to apologize for being firm if someone is just not listening. Um, so don't be afraid to get up, walk away. Um, be firm with a person. The, the vests and the collars can really help. Um, you might consider a taser. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> or pepper spray. No. I have, I have found I have found that the the sort of more um, I guess sort of shocking I can make my own voice like the sort of loud but also like very uh, I, I, the, the shorter the thing that you say works best, the shorter it is. So I usually say mine is not when they're saying like my dog is friendly or whatever. Mine is not like that, like very urgently say it like that because yeah. that sh kind of shocks people and makes them like freeze. Um, yeah. I'm also a giant human being. So maybe I scare the crap out of them, but I, I think that could work for anybody. If you, you know, you kind of, you have to get over, you know, sort of, fearing making them upset and and just kind of right right because if there's an incident then your dog your dog's going to be the one in trouble so yeah and you don't have to share your life story i also teach my dogs to go behind me so we didn't talk about this in the presentation but i actually teach them behind where i take them and i move them behind me so if that situation happens you know i do my best to get my body between the dog that's coming up and my dogs. Now, this has worked against me. I was, <laughs> we were out hiking and actually it was a Scotty. I hate to say this, but these two dogs came flying down a hillside. They should not have been off leash. Um, 
should not have been off leash. It was a wilderness area. My dogs were on leash. I got bit, but my dogs didn't. And so I got my dogs behind me and got in between and very firmly was like, no, go home. And the dog, one of the dogs bit me. And meanwhile, the owners were running down the hill. Oh, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. But I had a couple punctures in my leg, but my dogs were safe. So I actually teach that as a cue behind and I say it kind of firm and then I'll even practice no, you know, or <clears throat> go home is what I, what I commonly use. So that's a cue that I also teach because I really want my dogs to feel like I don't want you getting in front of me and feeling like you have to solve this. I will handle the situation. Um, so yeah, so being firm, walking away. Um, I've also had kids come running up where I'm like, stop, stop. Do not run up to my dogs. And, and I'll put my hand out and just be firm with the kids again while I'm putting them behind me. Um, in, I have white German shepherds and they're really pretty dogs and not all parents teach their kids how to be appropriate. Um, I will also just continue walking and act like I don't see the person. So we were walking through a parking lot and some kids came out of a church and saw my dogs and they're like flying across the parking lot and no parents were in sight. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, God, this could go south in a thousand ways. And so I just picked up my pace and kept walking and didn't even look at the kids. I just act like I didn't even see them. Said, let's go, guys, and just kept walking. And the kids lost interest. This, so might, those, not, this might not work for German Shepherds, too. But since Scotties are much smaller than that, I mean, sometimes I will have to pick up our one dog that like, we're always I'm always walking. Our you bet. Team, but. I might just have to pick up the one that is super, super reactive. Yep, great. If that's a great people strategy. If you start listening, too. then you have to do what you have to do to, to get your dog out of the situation. Yeah, some little dogs are really great. And, and I have a lot of clients that tell me, boy, if I pick them up, it just diffuses everything. The risk, the only risk in that is that some dogs will jump up and bite your dog's butt or bite you. So if it is a loose dog, there is some risk in that. But but I have a lot of clients that say that that really diffuses things and it's certainly easy and effective. And, you know, if it protects your dog, I mean, we did at the rally, um, was it the last year, the last time we did a rally, I did a presentation on um, under attack. So it was a whole presentation on what to do when that loose dog comes up. And I, and it was pretty well attended too. Um, so that's something that we could give again, too, because it was just a separate presentation on that. And there's, you know, obviously quite a few things you can do. So, so does that give you some ideas? Was that Kate? I can't remember. Is that Kate? Yes. Thank oh. you. That was, that was very helpful. I've actually had to, um, like, preemptively pick up my dog, Penny, when an off-leash dog, like, came running at her. Um, and she's, <laughs> she's like a 55-pound pit bull mix, so... But it definitely, it definitely helped because she, you know, she stayed calm and the owner was able to come and uh, remove their dog from the situation. Yeah. And, you know, um, Kate, there is also, there's a product that you can get. Um, it's made by PetSafe and it's called Spray Shield. Um, I have clients that use it who ride bikes in the country or people who walk in areas where there's a loose dog problem. So it's a, it's a citronella product and it sprays up to Gosh, I want to say 15 feet. I'd have to look. It's not like a uh, mace where you worry about blowback for you or your dog, but it's a citronella product. It comes with a holster so you can clip it right on your pants. So if a loose dog would coming come up, you can pull it out and spray it and it is a deterrent. So it can be a, a deterrent for a loose dog or an attacking dog. Or an owner who won't listen. Uh, it's made by PetSafe and it's called Spray Shield. Thank and you. It's a, it's a citronella product. So yeah, I have clients who use that in different, if it's a busy neighborhood with loose dogs, it won't hurt you, it won't hurt their dog, but it, it can be um, a deterrent. Um, with loose dogs, it can be super helpful to just kind of keep moving. Very often a loose dog, they may be protecting territory or trying to play. So the less interesting you can be, the more helpful it can be. So I'll work on leave it, let's go and I just keep walking and keep my dog's attention. And sometimes the other dogs will just lose interest and go back home. So. Thank you so much, uh, Jody. I think, Michelle, uh, we uh, 
or about maybe 15 to over here what we had planned, but thank you everybody for staying on. And I think people just dropped off when they needed to, but uh, great questions, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, if you guys want to stay, I'm happy to stay and answer questions. Otherwise, if we want to wrap it up, that's okay too. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. And if people want to contact you directly, Jody, um, or call you for a consult, we'll let them do that. Um, just out of respect for everyone's time. Um, we had a total of 33 of us on this, on this seminar today, and that is fabulous. Um, my kudos to you, Jody. you are my hero. Um, you're like the dog whisperer in Wisconsin in the Midwest, I think. Um, and Matt, you did a fabulous job of moderating with the questions. Thank you so much. And huge thank yous to all of you. Again, I posted the, the um, email for PayPal donations. It's, it's um, DC Scotty spelled S-C-O-T-T-I-E rally at gmail.com. And just so you know, those donations are going to cover the cost of paying um, some of our faculty need honorariums to do this for us. So that's what those funds are going to go for and also to help us host an unlimited platform on Zoom. So thank you again so much to everyone. Watch for our next announcement for our March session and I hope you all have a great weekend. And thank you, Michelle and Matt, for having me. And, you know, a couple of people in chat, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous, and this was a great webinar. So thanks for that feedback. Thanks for that um, positive reinforcement for us, too, those of you who are attending. And we really appreciate your giving up your time and, and joining us this morning. And um, I'm sure Michelle is open to feedback if you think of ways that this could be improved, because this is uh, my first live workshop and the Door County Scotty Rally's first live workshop, too. So. Um, any suggestions are appreciated, but thanks for joining us. You could go back to the screen share real quick and put up that uh, contact page. We've okay. had a couple of people ask for that throughout. So uh, if maybe if you're able to do the screen share and. Uh, you bet. Do we um, do we no. want the Scotty rally? Yes. Uh, maybe toggle between the two, put that one back up and then and then put your information up as well. Sure. And while Jody's doing that, I just want to remind everyone we are recording this session and this will be uh, posted um, probably on our Facebook page and we're having some problems with our website hosting right now, but it will ultimately be on our website as soon as that hosting problem is resolved. Okay, so here's the um, contact information for the Scotty Rally. dcscottyrally at gmail.org. Dot com. Dot com. Sorry. That's okay. And then here is my contact information. Thanks again, Jody. You bet. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, everyone. All right. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.